I will go ahead and turn on my video so that we can be a little more personable. All right, we're recording. It's all yours. Hey, okay, wonderful. All right. So, thanks for making it here, everybody. Uh, I guess I'm not showing video, am I, Robin? Stop share. There we go. Okay. Oh, there's some people there. Jack Travis. I see Dana. Wonderful. I guess I was on a different screen. Okay. Robin, uh, are you going to be speaking at all for this first part? I can if you want okay. me to jump in. I just, I just didn't know if you had your microphone ready to go, if you wanted to hop in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's great. I'm okay. just a little concerned the wall between us may cause some Probably will. <laughs> some yeah. feedback. You hear every time I sneeze. <laughs> All right. Well, I will go back to sharing the screen. So this is the first week of the module. We're pretty excited to get to this point. I will tell you that we have been working on this pretty much all year. Hopefully it somewhat shows in the content. Um, but this will be the format we follow every week. We'll have the Zoom meeting. The module will open at some point during that day, so you're more than welcome to hop in and start checking things out. Uh, as I wanted some, somebody asked earlier, when do we take the quizzes? When do we do assignments? The idea is pretty much that you would, after our Zoom meeting, jump into the content. Although if you already have, that's great because it might give you ideas of questions you want to ask. I think we'll try to leave some room at the end. That's when the microphone's coming on might uh, make an appearance. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and move into the first module. But thanks again, everybody, for signing up and following along and making it here to the first Zoom meeting. It's uh, great to have you. All right. So here's our slides. So as I was saying, welcome to Tech Labs. We're running most of this on the Moodle platform. That's what we're using for the classroom as pretty much all of you have already logged in and taken the pre-assessment. I will say that we have a good variety of students from looking at the pre-assessment. Some of you are feeling pretty new and maybe not real confident with technology. There's a few of you out there that probably could be teaching this class yourself. So, but we, we're really glad to have you around no matter what your skill level is. So as I was saying, the module features, we just mentioned about the Zoom meeting. So the idea of the Zoom meeting is to reclass, recap the last module. Uh, obviously we don't have that this week. And then we'll give you an overview of the current week's module. Every week there's probably going to be a reading assignment and that's just something for you to go over at your own speed. Uh, each week there should also be a quiz. We might actually replace quizzes at some times with projects. I know working on module six, which is network, uh, it might not be a quiz so much as some, something for you to create like a network diagram. Uh, there's always going to be the forum available from the pre-module area. Feel free to use the forum as a place to pose questions. You're also more than welcome to ring us up here at the office or send us an email. Rob and I are both available on Google Chat, so feel free to shoot us a message then. And even once the class is done, hopefully we're here as a resource for you as you come up with problems in the future. So if you haven't been somebody that reaches out to us much in the past, we hope that you feel confident and comfortable reaching out to us in the future. Uh, I mentioned there's the glossary of terms. I really think for the first module, that's going to be uh, pretty key if you don't have a whole lot of tech knowledge. A lot of these questions that we're going to look at later kind of assume that either you're looking up terminology in the glossary or quickly Googling it, but it doesn't really walk you through a lot of those questions. So. Don't feel overwhelmed when you run into a bunch of acronyms and jargon that you're not familiar with. That's what that part is there for. Obviously, we have the pre-assessment that many of you already have taken. We have a post-assessment at the very end of this uh, six weeks just to see where we might have improved. I would like to mention that the assessments have uh, are pulled nearly directly from the Web Junction staff technology competencies. So although we are trying to address some of these competencies, 
it's not that this class is going to step by step work through each of the competencies. That's not really the direction we went with it. It's kind of a guideline to figure out where we are and what we can work on. As you might have seen in the pre-module part, there is a Neckles Technology Manual listed. This is a, I guess, book or PDF that we started working on about a year ago when Greg Gantz came to Neckles. If you have suggestions for the manual, we'd love to hear from you. We'll even throw you a badge. We gotta do some gamification. Speaking of badges, most of you, if you've filled out your pre-assessment, should have been awarded your first badge. You would get an email from Robin for that. So just a little gamification to keep uh, us interacting. Then there's one more document in that first section. It's keeping technology healthy. This is kind of a throwback to some of the older tech classes we used to have. Sorry, I'm seeing chat and I just wanted to make sure. You weren't able to open the manual. Okay, Kayla, we'll make sure that we figure that out. It might be in a weird iBook format because uh, Greg and I were both working on Apple. We're trying to use iBook authors uh, to create that manual. Yeah, definitely we'll get you a PDF of that. But if you do have submissions, we'd love to just take them in Word documents. Again, that manual has a lot of information about using deep freeze, how we've set up the program Ninite to do auto updates, and just some pretty library specific ways that we've been using software in the NECL system. So some of you who are kind of new to our system, which we have quite a few of you, that manual might kind of be a catch-all of different topics uh, to look into further, okay? So those are some of the module features that we'll have every week. Um, there are some expectations that we have for us as uh, the teachers and you as learners. Uh, we'd like to see you keep up. So don't let yourself get too far behind. I think that this kind of comes from Robin's experience with new director training. I'm guessing that she probably knows that as people fall behind, the likelihood of them keeping up with it, I'm guessing, maybe becomes slimmer and slimmer. Is that maybe what you were thinking there, Robin? Um, I, I know how that works. Pretty much exactly. That's okay. uh, that's one of those things that it it is way harder to catch up than it is to keep up. So right. we know it's it's asking you to invest some time, but uh, hopefully not too much. Right. I, mean, I I feel like some of these things, especially in the first module, the quiz might take a while. Um, it's you know we'll get into that later but there's not a whole lot of homework involved. So if you can just spend a little bit of time with it just to keep yourself involved with the class, please do. And, and make sure you reach out to us if you are having any issues. Uh, call us, like I said before, email or use the forum. I, I put learn new skills under expectations. We are a group of people that have a very wide group of talents in technology. So we're really leaving it up to you to make sure that this time is well spent for you. If, if you're not catching a hold of everything, that's fine. Just make sure that you're trying to learn as much as you can. If you're somebody who has a lot of technology skills and like I said, could be teaching this class, you know, springboard into other topics. We have some other resources here for you to use. Feel free to drop us a line. If it's something like, hey, you know, I really thought this was gonna be more about WordPress let us know. We will make adjustments, at least for your individual case. We want this to be as tailored as it can be, um, but we're always also trying to do a catch-all for lots of different skills. Um, and the final point on expectations is please help us make this tech lab better. This is the first time we've ever done anything like this. We've never had a training initiative that's open to every library, every public library anyways, in Northeast Kansas. So any feedback you have is appreciated. You know, even if it's as simple as your grammar stinks on question four, or it doesn't make any sense, I found it too hard to answer, things like that are fine. Um, Robin and I have talked about the future of this class. I think it's quite possible that we'll just open this up after we're done here so that people can learn at their own speed. Or maybe there'll be more classes in the future, but either way, um, please give us your feedback so we can get better at this. All right, moving forward. Anybody have any questions, feel free to jump into chat on 
expectations or module features. So just jumping into the objectives of module one, and this is what you would be seeing inside the class.neckles.org for objectives. So what we hope will happen, that objective one, you're given a diagram of a workstation that you will be able to identify and explain the function of the common computer hardware. Uh, this really depends on your level of comfort with technology. Maybe we only get to the point that you can show us what the hard drive is and what a video card is. That's great for some of you. Um, yeah, Katura, I did have a question there, Robin. Right now, you really don't need to go to class.neckles.org. That is class.neckls.org. Uh, this information is kind of supplementary to that. I don't know if you really need to pull it up at this moment. Um, as well as learning about computer hardware, if you already can identify it, we'd hope that you can uh, given a diagram of cabling and ports that you'll be able to identify the function of those different cables, why you would use one in one particular instance and why you would use another in other chance, other times. Uh, we'd like you to demonstrate a working knowledge of common technology based terminology and concepts. So that's really where the glossary comes. I'll cover this more later, but it's really when we have that shared vocabulary that we are able to troubleshoot much more easily, especially when it's over the phone or through email. If we all share the same words, then we can move forward through problems a lot more smoothly. And the last objective is given problematic hardware and software scenarios, we'll hope to demonstrate a successful troubleshooting process. So a lot of this stuff is kind of, uh, you know, if we could actually put you in a real a real situation to troubleshoot, that would probably, probably be most ideal to learn about troubleshooting. However, in a classroom situation, we have to use what we have. So anecdotal problems that we've had in the past and how we dealt with them. Really though, in this first module, we're just trying, as far as troubleshooting goes, to make sure that everybody has, an, has a somewhat of a troubleshooting process. So the first part of this module will be diagrams. Like I said, we'll want you to know your cables, want you to be able to look inside your machine, Take means opening it up, uh, use part numbers to ID components, and you know, we'll Google and manufacture, using the Google and the manufacturer's website. I'm gonna switch back over to my camera because I did open up a computer here. One moment. Okay, it's asking me to leave the meeting. No, please don't. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, so first of all, I would just like to grab some props here. It's gonna be hard for you to see it and it's probably a lot easier for you to look at the diagrams. I just thought I would show you real world examples here just for a moment. Of course, I, there's the time, 2.16, plenty of time. So the first thing I thought I would grab are these two cables that look nearly identical, especially from the sides. But really, these are the modern monitor cables. So even if you've been around computing for a long time, you still might not be real familiar with them. I just grabbed one that's HDMI and one that is display port. So if you have a new computer with a new video card, it most likely has one of these connections. Now, it's quite possible that you're much more used to seeing these cables, which are our white cable and our blue cable. This would be an analog cable that's been around probably as long as you remember hooking up computers. That's VGA. That's all analog signal. Degrades over length. Uh, then we have DVI, which is actually a digital signal. Um, DVI and, just, and HDMI are very similar. It's just the form function. So we have these great hooks on the side here that get caught on everything when you try to route them through a desk. Whereas that's the nice thing about these streamlined display port and HDMI cables. They don't have these stupid little thumb screws to get stuck on everything and hurt your fingers as you try to unscrew them. So definitely just some form factor improvements. But really, the thing is just to know if somebody says, check the VGA cable, 
or it doesn't have a VGA cable, that we can say, yes, with confidence, this is a VGA cable. Now, the colors can change sometimes. You won't always have a blue VGA. Sometimes it'll just be the same color as the cabling itself. It'll be black. Same thing with these DVI. So then you have to be really kind of familiar with, well, it's the wider one with the different, different types of pins. Um, so really, it's just a familiarity. You might not be the person that fixes some of these things, but if we can say, hey, I'm going to need a VGA or a DVI, that you're able to follow along, all right? Again, these diagrams will have some pictures that show a little bit closer, maybe a better light of what these different ports and cables are. I know there's a picture just like this. Um, so just be familiar for the quiz, what these different types of ports are. You'll have to drag and drop the name of it onto the port. Um, as you can see, this guy here has HDMI. This one kind of throws you off because it looks like it might be an HDMI as well, but it's actually one called eSATA. eSATA is used for data. So if I had a certain type of uh, external hard drive, it might connect on that. It moves a lot faster than USB. It ties into the bus, and that would be the main way data moves through the computer. Uh, let's see if we have any other cool ports on here. This one has VGA as well, so this could hook up to an HDMI or a VGA projector if we needed it to. Nothing else too special. As you can see here, that's a USB port. It's blue because it's USB 3.0. If you're not familiar with that already, USB 2.0 is going to be a little slower. 3.0 can move us, uh, move data a lot faster. Try to get my Windows fixed. Okay. Uh, last thing with props, since we have an ancient old Optiplex, a 740. So it might be a little old, but it's also pretty common. Uh, the main thing I will say is no, if you're going to be the person who's helping along with your technology, be familiar with how it opens. So Optiplexes forever and ever, when they're this big form, this big size, usually have something you pull off here and that ejects the side panel that pulls out. We also use a lot of small form, uh, uh, form function desktops. So those ones might look a little bit different. They might have a thumb screw that you have to unhook from the back. Um, a lot of times those thumb screws, you really need to have a Phillips screwdriver because they're on there so tight. But the idea is that usually there's some sort of release mechanism and then you can open it up and look at the insides. Um, this is a good size to show all the different parts uh, of a computer because they're nice and big. If we were to open up a small form factor Optiplex that we just bought recently, you'll see that everything is compressed. It's much more like a laptop where everything is on top of each other. When you are in those situations, these days, manufacturers do try to make it somewhat easy to figure out how things come apart. So take it, keep an eye out for things like this that are different colors than the rest. That's usually a sign that it's something that you can slide or adjust to get something open and move apart. But the smaller the machine, the more you have to kind of expand them. The idea though is with a workstation or desktop computer, it is usually much easier to get in there than say with a laptop. Um, so if you look at your diagrams, you're going to see something that looks almost exactly like this in one of the diagrams. Um, what we're really looking for is knowing that this is the power supply unit, the PSU. Uh, these are your drives. I think they're, we call them the five and a quarter. This is where your optical drives would stick out. Down here would be uh, where smaller uh, components can slide into. That would have been where our floppy disk drive would have been. You can see it's not nearly as wide as the other ones. Not a whole lot of uses for this these days. How, um, if you get a new solid state drive or something like that that comes out much smaller, you might find yourself mounting it to a different spot like this. Um, one point I was going to make earlier is that, you know, when we're dealing with computers, the computer proper, everything here is pretty much about power and data moving forward. The purpose of almost every piece here is to move power or to move data onto the next uh, piece of equipment. 
And then there's just the heavy metal for keeping it all together. This is stupid. Okay. More hard drive space. Here we have some expansion bays here. So if I had a video card, I could put one in here. We were looking at PCI Express. Older versions were AGP and before that PCI. So there's lots of history that goes on that has changed over time. The main piece here would be the motherboard. Everything plugs into that. We have a couple of RAM modules up here that would slide out pretty easily. That's something that a lot of people should be familiar with if you're working with computers, is to know how to get those RAM out because if you're gonna do an upgrade, that's one of the easiest things to do. Um, besides that, there's not a whole lot of things I would, the CPU's hiding under this big black cover here, and that's just to keep airways moving. There's a fan below there to cool off the fins. You might be able to see it from the side, there you go. Um, here we have the system battery. Again, all this is in the diagram, but I just thought it might be good just to show it in real life. Um, but that's really all I was going to show on that. I think the diagrams are much easier to work with. Okay. Again, on this PowerPoint that I was sharing, I mentioned a few things for your quizzes. You'll want to know your cables. Uh, feel free to look inside a machine. What I recommend is even if you don't open up a machine, take a look around the computers in your library or at home and see what types of ports you have and think through your head, you know, what is that? What, what is that particular type of cable? When I first started in technology, I had all of these cables that had gathered and I finally got to that point where I kind of knew what a lot of them were. And so I had spent all this time putting them in all kinds of different boxes and labeling, this is a serial cable, this is a USB cable. Um, it just really takes that time of looking at them uh, so that you know off the top of your head what their function is and which one is, might be superior. Again, I said using part numbers to ID components. I've had, I've run across a card before and I have no idea what it's there for. That's usually it's older equipment, but there's usually some sort of identifier on it that you can research and find out what it was. Switch back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So terminology. Terminology and using the correct terminology or at least the same terminology that I'm gonna use here that uh, Kate uses up in Seneca is important so that we can fix problems, but it's also critical when you're trying to research problems uh, on the internet or trying to explain them to others. A good example of this, is, in my mind, is if you were to go to a forum and try to describe an issue we're having with, let's say, Envisionware's PC reservation software, without having that terminology or that vocabulary to back, uh, to back up on, then you're not able to communicate with other people on a forum what your particular issue is. So spending that time really being familiar with lots of tech terms can be really important, especially as you're just starting out. An example of the confusion this causes is when we hear something like, my screen is blank. That can mean so many different things. It could mean that there's nothing showing up on the desktop, or maybe their wallpaper image changed, or there's just a cursor on the background. So being really specific about what you mean really takes us a lot further than having to use very basic descriptions. The terminology area is broken into several different categories. So if you're going through that, feel free to limit it to a certain area. We've got terms that are broken into hardware, so that'd be the parts of the computer. E-content, a lot of that has to do with things like the overdrive service, uh, which is the Sunflower e-library. Also things like 3M Cloud Library or from the State Library. We have mobile content, that's usually talking about things like Android versus iOS. That would be Apple's operating system. Networking, there's a lot of terms about protocols that are in use and hardware. Those are gonna be really confusing if you're not familiar because we just throw them at you in the questions. So you'll have to go back and look to see what they're talking about in that question. Lots of different operating system, not just the Windows operating system, but mostly. 
And a lot of it's going to talk about folder and file structure. So it might be something that you've been overlooking or taking for granted exactly the difference between files and folders. We'll talk a little bit about peripherals, but not a whole lot because there's just so much variety out there. Uh, but scanners and printers, definitely adding printers via, or adding network printers we will cover, not in this week's module, but later on. And uh, finally, software and applications will be another part of the terminology. Uh, we'd love to hear your submissions. So if you are going along with this class and you come up with a term that you're not familiar with and you checked out the terminology uh, glossary, please let us know so that we can get that information in there. Just want to take a moment, make sure everybody's on board here. Looks like it. All right, we'll move on. So the hardware and software quiz. This is one of the assignments that we have this week. There's around 50 parts of this quiz, so it's not the shortest of quizzes, it's not the longest, but it could take a while to get through it. So you might know that you can only hit it for a little bit and then come back later, or just know that you know this might take you 30 minutes or so to get through, depending on your comfort level with the different terms. That's really what's gonna be the stumbling block for some of you. Uh, if you're really familiar with these terms, you could probably breeze the quiz in about three to five minutes. If you have to look up everything that they're talking about, it could take you a lot longer, but anything you're learning through this, I think will be a benefit to you. Again, like I said, you're gonna look up terms that are unfamiliar. There's a lot of unexplained jargon here. Check the glossary or Google, please. If you're, while taking the quiz and you're realize that it's not going super smoothly, please take notes on the questions you're having difficulty with. Follow up with us with, uh, for, with more research on your own or ask Robin or I for help. Uh, Kayla asked a good question. When we take the quizzes, are we able to use the information you've given us? Yes, it's an open book quiz. So feel free to have the diagrams open. Some of the diagrams are the same from the quiz as they were in the written material, so feel free to have that up. Just make sure you're processing it while you do it. Uh, don't just fill in the blank and not put it into the memory. But when it comes time for you to actually start doing this stuff, if you if you do, you know, say have to get into the computer, no one's going to expect you to not have a reference material next to you. You'll you'll be able to use Google and that kind of thing. So we're not going to ask you to uh, have all this memorized, but at least know. Have, have familiarity with the material that Dan has presented and know where to go to find the information would be awesome. That's a really good point, Robin. I mean, nobody lives in a vacuum when they're doing this work. And it doesn't matter if you are coding or if you are working on networks. At some point or another, you pull out your phone and you have to look something up. Or if you're coding, you're finding other examples of what people have done before you. Nobody is sitting here, for the most part, doing all this from scratch on their own. I, you know, I am constantly looking up information while I'm doing my job. And a lot of it is just knowing how to look for those answers. So that's the stumbling block where I think people are doing just in modern technology training. is not so much getting people to know specifics, but have the ability to find answers that they need. So with the troubleshooting part, um, I actually have a document that goes along with this under troubleshooting. Uh, it's a little bit longer, but so these are just a few tips on developing a troubleshooting strategy. So this might be troubleshooting technology, or really it could be troubleshooting your vehicle or any other problems you run into. Once you have a strong troubleshooting process, you really should be able to use it when you attack any kind of problem, especially a technical one. But pretty specific to any kind of technology is, uh, the first tip really is power cycling. And power cycling, if we say that, we mean to basically unplug it for 15 to 30 seconds. We want the power cable to be unplugged. A lot of times people get confused on this and think we mean a bunch of ethernet cables out of a switch or something like that. But really we want you to determine which, which cord to, provides the power, and let's unplug that for 15 to 30 seconds. 
So what happens during that time? Well, these electronic devices have capacitors, and capacitors, as you have seen a million times in your life, uh, are the little cylinders that pop up out of circuit boards. Those little guys hold on to power after the power has been drained. So 15 to 30 seconds, we figure most standard capacitors will drain the power, and the technology that had kind of a memory to itself is drained and we can start from fresh when we turn it back on. And not just turn it back on, but plug the power back into it. So we can power cycle lots of different type of equipment and have it help us out. It's pretty common to power cycle your modem after an internet outage or your router. We have to power cycle wireless access points when people can no longer connect to Wi-Fi or maybe the SSID or the wireless network name is not showing. We have a Keurig coffee pot here at the office that every once in a while gets uh, a bunch of gibberish on the screen and maybe it starts shooting out half shots of coffee. You have to power cycle that thing every once in a while. So it could be all types of technology. Uh, as long as it's a digital machine, power cycling can help. So uh, the first thing we usually ask anybody to do after they run into a problem especially if it's a problem they've never seen before, is to power cycle their equipment. Um, the next part is working from the bottom up or outside in. I say in the document this is a good example of keep it simple, stupid, or KISS. So we're saying don't neglect the obvious, first of all. Um, always check the cables if you're having trouble with a specific computer hardware, uh, like your monitor or keyboard. Check those cables first. Uh, it's an easy first step to check out all related cables to make sure they're properly connected. Um, with that same idea in mind of working from the outside in or the bottom up, any, any kind of direction you can think of, but usually we're saying work from simple to complex. So we talk a lot, there's an example in uh, one of the quizzes or in the written, uh, written materials about tracing a power failure. A lot of times we're talking about tracing the power first from the wall, make sure that you have power to your power strip. So does my power strip light up? And this is something that's come up a lot lately is make sure all of those power plugs on your power strip are providing power. So how do you do that? You need to switch devices around on your power strip. Don't take it for granted that just because the power strip has a light on it, that all the outlets are working on it. It's not true, it happens all the time, and it's something that's really easy to, uh, to forget about. So working from the outside in, we check the power on the wall, that it has power, we check the power strip light, we check that the power strip outlet is working, we check the power cable and the computer, so we make sure, do we see a little light on the back of the computer that tells us there is at least some power going to it? If we can't even get that far, we might need to change out the power cables that go from the power strip to the computer. It is possible for something like that to go wrong. But the idea is let's make sure that stuff works before we start moving into the computer. Before we decide it's the motherboard that's not working, we need to make sure it's not the power supply. And if that means having another computer nearby that we can switch out power supplies, uh, that's the way to do it. And that gets us into the process of elimination, actually. At that point, when to make sure that something is working correctly, a lot of times you really don't know until you take a model or a piece of equipment that you know is working and switch it out with something that you're not sure if it is. If you can take a power supply that you thought might be bad but put it in another computer and everything works fine, you've now eliminated the power supply as being part of the problem. So you don't have to go as deep as taking out the motherboard and replacing it, but I mentioned that power cord before that could go wrong. As part of your process of elimination, grab something easy like a power cord and swap that out. Swap out the power strip. Depending on your level of comfort, you might then start swapping out the power supply or even the motherboard. Um, let me see if I had any other points about that. Test them out one by one. Try to duplicate problems. Uh, solve it in a known environment. You know, that's what we're often doing if we have a tech bench is to come bring the computer back, set it up, start pulling parts out and swapping them out and seeing what part is functioning and what's not. Now that kind of sounds like it could be going kind of crazy and it can if you don't take steps to make sure you document your work. So it does, it's not real helpful 
if you start switching out motherboards and power supplies and RAM, if you haven't had some way of making sure that you know what has been tried so far. So once you start troubleshooting, you might want to write down each step you take. That way you'll be able to remember exactly what you have done and when you talk to other people, you can explain to them what steps have already been taken. Um, take notes about error messages. If an error message pops up, take a screenshot of it. If you have to, grab your camera and take a, take a picture of it. A lot of times we get reports of problems and somebody says, we know there was some sort of error message, but we don't know what it was. So, and that's, it's possible to miss those. If it's a blue screen message that pops up after your computer has crashed, you might not have time to take a picture of it. But if you can, try to document what those messages are, especially if you're trying to figure out problems that don't happen all the time. It's really nice to have a log of what we've seen so far so we know what can we Google, what, you know, what can we combine with this error message, like the type of software we have, to figure out where there might be a problem. Um, but definitely keep your documentation. I will say, as you all know, or maybe know, I work with Greg Gantz here at the office. He started about a year ago. Him being a newer tech, I can see that he has a really good talent for making sure he documents his work. He writes it down in a notebook when he runs into problems. And I kind of take it for granted just because I've been doing this a lot longer, so I'm not as keen on writing down steps that have solved problems before. But I tell you what, when we run into an issue that we've seen before, I'm asking Greg to look it up in his, in his notebook because he's actually written it down and we have somewhere to go from there. So if you can document your work, it's really a big part of being a tech is to document everything. Finally, be informed. Research the error messages. I put it on the document, refine your Google Foo. So, you know, find out how to get better searches. And a lot of that is by being specific about your problems so you get better answers. Um, be aware of how security may affect your computer and how hardware and software is supposed to behave. So this is what they talk a lot about is having a baseline. Know how things are when they're operating correctly. Know what your internet is like when it's going correctly. Do a speed test. That way when you do a speed test later, you can see the difference. Uh, be familiar with troubleshooting tools you'll be using. And finally, join forums and group messaging lists so you can find additional support. If I have specific software that I have to support, like Envisionware or LibKey, which is another patron time management, it's really good to be on those forums so that you're seeing messages come in. You might see a message come in from somebody else that addresses an issue you had, but until you saw them post it, you never realized how it might be working or not working. Okay, so the troubleshooting quiz is gonna be a little bit shorter than the hardware and software quiz, but it's possibly more difficult. Uh, there's a lot of open-ended questions, I think, We're really trying to pull from uh, past experiences here. And like I said, it's difficult to train on troubleshooting when you don't have, it's really something you kind of learn in the field. Some of the CompTIA certifications that you can get, that would be being certified to be a technician. Uh, some of them have some really good resources for troubleshooting. Uh, but really, until you run into it in the field, it's really difficult to wrap your mind around what's the possible problems. Um, in these troubleshooting quiz, there's even more unexplained jargon. So, as before, check the glossary or Google as, if you're running into problems. Um, I said quiz draws from real world problems. So, you may run into these problems or you may have ran into the past. It might be a good idea to try to commit some of this to memory so that if you run into it in the future, it'll trigger for you. Again, document the questions that you have difficulty with and then research them or ask for more help later. So, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. So this section, I just wanted to talk a little bit about being a tech person. It's, it's only when we're tested that we become a lot better at our jobs. If you're in an environment where nothing ever breaks, then you don't have as many opportunities to learn things. So, 
it's not unexpected that you're going to run into issues. That's part of the job. But be prepared. Always have a backup and be familiar with your systems. So don't wait until you have to get into a particular system that you don't know the password for and you've never been inside it. Don't wait till it's broken to be the first time that you're in there. I know when we had, for example, our analog phone systems break, the first time it really had real problems. I'd never been in it before. It makes it much more difficult when you have to try to track down how do I log in? Where is the address for it? Be familiar with these things before it becomes a problem. Um, as far as backing up, that could be make sure that you have a backup of the Word document. Make sure you, before you work on somebody's computer that you've saved all their Word documents they have open. I don't know how many times I have made that mistake where I needed to reboot somebody's machine that I was sitting at and I forgot to ask them if they had saved their Word document before. That is not a place you want to be. Anytime you can make a backup or save, do so, please. Um, but don't fear. Ask questions and reach out to your peers. I know as somebody who's worked in technology for a long time, uh, sometimes it can be kind of embarrassing to ask questions. You feel like maybe you should already know the answers. I would just say, please go forward with lots of questions. Uh, don't worry about saving face um, and reach out to people because that's when you find more information. Release the pressure. So whenever there's a technology issue, it seems like everything comes to a grinding stop and people start panicking and patrons get upset and staff gets upset. So your job, however, is to be there to fix it. So find ways to get people up and running some other way while you work on what you need to work. It depends on the certain situation, but you know, for example, if PC reservation, which is the Envisionware time management product stops working, you have a few options, but one of your options could be disable the patron time management software on the patron computers so that those people can start browsing, checking Facebook, playing games, getting airline tickets, while you have time to do your job. If you, if you have to, maybe releasing the pressure means we're shutting down Patreon computers for the afternoon while we work this out, or there will be no wireless, and I have to explain that to staff, that that's gonna be a problem. But it's a really difficult situation to have everybody looking at you to try to fix the problem. It's a lot of pressure on your shoulders. So it's really up to you because nobody else is going to really look out for you, for you to say, hey, this is going to take me a little bit of time. Let's find a backup plan for right now for our workflow. And that'll allow you to start focusing on the problem without having 10, 15 people breathing down your neck. Uh, finally, on that note, remain calm. So while everybody else is panicking, they're looking at you to find the solution. And it's really about not getting rattled because when you're rattled, you cannot think through and you cannot document and you cannot figure out what parts of your troubleshooting process have not been addressed. So it's really important, even when it's a high stress moment, to try to remain calm. It's the best way that you'll find your inner guru. So, so we have some additional resources available. Um, at the top of the pre-module mentions the ALA Library Support Staff Certification. That might be something some of you are interested in following through with. Uh, it's several different classes that come together to be certified as a support staff member. I don't know if, Robin, do you have anything to throw in about the ALA Library Support Staff? Um, it's not cheap, but yeah. that's the kind of thing that Neckles might be able to provide grants for staff if uh, no guarantees but but um, we do have CE grants and this would be a, a worthy uh, use of the money if you decide that this is something you all want to do and, and sometimes just taking a look at some of that stuff you know before you decide oh it's not for me it might be worth looking it up on ALA site or checking out the book uh, that we have listed that is available as the in the professional collection that I don't think anybody has checked out yet. So, 
you might take a look at it and just see if, you know, that might be a path you'd like to go to. So it's definitely something that looks good on a resume, helps with hiring. If you ever move on to another position, uh, nice thing to have if you're not, you know, uh, MLS type person. Another certification would be CompTIA. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is uh, usually kind of how techs start on their journey. Uh, everybody's got a different journey, but a lot of people start with taking an A plus CompTIA certification. What that consists of is usually people take a class or they self study with a book like the one mentioned from Mike Myers, uh, and then they pay to take the test and they're certified at that point. Um, again, it's a good way to develop good troubleshooting skills. Uh, I know a lot of people that have taken the certification just have a better head on their shoulders about, about a troubleshooting process, or maybe they learned it all in the field. But these certifications are a good way to get experience in technology, and you can kind of work your way up. Usually people take an A-plus first, and then they might take the Network Plus or the Security Plus, network being you know, some information that a network administrator might need to know. Security Plus would be people who deal in IT security with me. I mentioned uh, Professor Messer under that area. He's got some great videos to follow along with if you do choose to do the A-plus certification, or at least just take a look at it. It's gonna be way more in depth than anything we're gonna be able to cover in this class, because if you see this book, it's pretty darn hefty, the Mike Myers one, so. Um, and the website for those certifications is certification dot comptia dot org slash home so even maybe if it's not for you but you know somebody who's uh, wants to look into being a professional computer tech and move up that way those are some good ways to get started so just something to know about as you deal with technology that those are the professional certifications often used by computer techs network administrators that type of thing and even if you decide not to, to go the certification route, um, your uh, Lawrence Public Library does offer lynda.com and they do have CompTIA certification videos. So even if you're not planning on taking the, um, taking the actual certification tests, uh, just making yourself aware of what kind of information is out there uh, can be done through the Lawrence Public Library and lynda.com and anybody in Nichols can get a Lawrence library card you just have to go ask for one show you live in the 14 county Nichols area so thanks um, there are some other books in our Nichols professional collection as well um, so you're more than welcome if you are an express person to jump on there and take a look if you're ever in Lawrence you might just hop into our professional collection area. We're not talking about a huge amount of books, but there are some pretty good specialized um, resources there. I know I saw one for TCP IP, which you know is basically the protocol of the internet that I didn't even know we had that. I don't know when it popped in there. So, but there's a lot of resources like that that you're more than welcome to look at. Um, the last part there, Robin mentioned lynda.com. There's also what Treehouse. That's which, through Topeka. Through Topeka. And, and again, then, you yeah. can get that card. Uh, anybody in the Nichols area can get a card there. And then GCF Learn Free, which I know we're going to point you to later in later modules. Um, great place for things like Microsoft Office training, um, getting more familiar with Windows 10, that type of thing is what you'll find at GCF Learn Free. And that one is, as is in the title, completely free and does not require a library card to access. <laughs> all right. So that's pretty much all of the resources I had, at least for this Zoom meeting. Um, darn it. There we go. Let's switch my video. Okay. Um, I suppose now uh, we have 10 minutes to go. There's the modules for you to start taking a crack at and the quizzes. This week should be pretty simple as far as what you need, what we expect you to do. You know, really it's pop through those quizzes. It might be for you super simple to just answer them. Feel free to take a stab and see how difficult they are. And if you're getting hung up, then go back and look at the other materials. Um, but 
it's, it's not too complex as far as what we're trying to get done through this week. So if you could try to get that done here by the end of the week, uh, I think pretty much everybody filled out their pre-assessment. So we're done with that. And those who haven't, I've gotten a couple of questions actually about the, there's no submit button on that. You just fill it out. It right. saves automatically. So I've had a couple of people comment that the submit, lack of submit button through them. Don't worry yeah. about it. Just yeah. fill it out and it's done. And we'll see your process as you go through it as well. But again, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to take time and work with you if you'd like to. Um, again, those of you who are breezing through it, let, let's talk about, you know, your next six weeks in this course too. Um, for, for the people that are feeling overwhelmed, it's, it's, it's fairly easy for us to kind of build a, this curriculum. For those of you who, you know, this might just be going over things, it's a little bit more difficult for us to know how we can make the best of the situation for you. So again, we haven't done it. Robin's done a lot of Zoom trainings. This is really kind of new for me. Most of the technology tr training we've done is, you know, sit down 10 employees at a, at a computer station. And honestly, a lot of the times, those types of trainings don't really seem to get anybody anywhere. So hopefully this type of process that we go to and come back and think about, sleep on it overnight, hopefully that's the type of thing that'll work. So we'll find out. Um, I don't really think I have a whole lot of more. I know you have you have pounded this in, but we really, really, really want your feedback um, desperately, uh, even if it's not um, complimentary. <laughs> we're we're thick skinned over here. We're tech folks. We can handle it. Um, but we wanted to want it to work for you guys, and and we're willing to work with you to make that happen. So feel free to drop us a line. I guess that's about it. Um, if you have questions, feel free to enter them in chat. Don't think we covered anything that was too mind blowing. Really just kind of going over modules. So don't think we really have a whole lot of other messages here. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and stop.